If we have not met yet, my name is Todd Pope. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to um, start by, we're going to do something a little different, probably like once a month. We want to we start praying regularly for other churches in our community because uh, they're our teammates. And I, we're not in competition with any other gospel-believing church in this area. We are, we are teammates. And, the, and the, God's word says when one part suffers, we all suffer. And so this morning I want to pray for Elmbrook Church. Uh, I've got good friends in Elmbrook, and they're hurting today if you followed the news recently. And so would you just join with me, and let's pray for Elmbrook. God, we thank you so much for your grace. Lord, I thank you that your grace is greater than all of our sin. And so, Lord, we just come and we uh, join together today, and we pray for Elmbrook Church. We pray that you would... Uh, that you would minister to them as they're going through a hurting season, that you would minister to them. God, I pray that this would be a season that they would have tremendous unity. Uh, God, I pray that you would anoint the leadership there. God, that you would just help them to, to navigate these waters. And I just pray for your favor. Uh, God, I pray that the gospel would continue going forth. I pray that people would continue getting saved. And Lord, that you would build that church and, and strengthen them in a tremendous way. Uh, Lord, we pray for all the, the families. We pray for Pastor Jason. We pray that you would minister to him and his family, that you would touch them. And God, we just give you praise, and we honor you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would speak to us today through this message. Uh, God, that you'd help us to tune in and to hear your voice. God, you're speaking. You're leading. Help us to hear and help us to follow. And God, we give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to those that are watching online or if you're watching this at a later time, watching the podcast. Uh, we've been in this series called Let. Uh, this is our third week. And we've been exploring scriptures in the New Testament that, that use that word, let. You know, the first week we Jesus said, let me teach you. Last week we talked about uh, let the peace of Christ rule your heart and mind. And, and so today we're, we've got another double let passage, a passage of scripture that has two lets. Uh, but what we're learning, in fact, in our community group on, on uh, Friday night, one of the people in the group said, I never like, considered like, how powerful this little, this little word is. And so that's my prayer for all of us, that maybe we haven't tuned in to like, how incredibly powerful this word is, and we're learning that. But when the scriptures say, let this happen, uh, for instance, let me teach you, when that invitation is given, what's it saying? It means that we could also not let. And so we have an opportunity. We have a role to play. We have a choice to make. And so today we're going to look at, again, a double let passage in Galatians chapter 5. But before I read our verses, let me ask this question. And it says, what is it that guides your life? What is it that guides your life? Uh, you know, and, and some people might say, like, the thing that guides his life is his desire to be right. Like he's, got to, he's going to argue his way until he's right. He's going to argue his way until you surrender and submit that he is right. But he is going to be right. Like that is, that's what guides his life. Or maybe they would say the GPS, and maybe you've met someone like this, but the GPS in her life is her family. Like her life centers around her family. Like what they think, what they do. Uh, like family is the most important thing in her life. Uh, or the driver for him is success. Like, it is driven by success, it is driven for success, but that's what guides his life. Or maybe she is controlled by whether people like her or not. Like, she has a hard time separating uh, when somebody is disagreeing with her, like they're rejecting her. And she has a hard time separating those two because she's kind of controlled by whether people like her or not. Or he's directed by competition, like he just needs to be the best at whatever he's doing. Now, how can you know what drives your life? How can you know what drives your life? The let verses that we're going to read today, the passage that we're going to read today, I think give us a great direction. It gives us a great answer to that. I think it's a very helpful answer. And so let's read. I'm going to read our whole passage first, and then we'll break it down into our let verses. Galatians 5, 16 through 25, the Apostle Paul says, So I say, let the, Spirit, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to, do, wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. 
These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So this passage again, a double let passage. Let the Holy Spirit guide our lives and let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. The Holy Spirit, this is something I've learned. The Holy Spirit is always leading but we're not always following. Like he's always speaking, he's always leading, he's always directing, but we're not always following. We don't let him always guide us. And let me let you in on a secret. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me let you in on a secret that might offend you. Are, are you ready? Like put on your big boy pants or your big girl pants. This might offend you. You are not smart enough to direct your own life. And neither am I, right? And if you think you are, you probably have made some messes in your life when you've done that, right? We're not smart enough. Like, I need the Holy Spirit to direct me and to guide me and to guide my life because I am not smart enough. I mean, how many times have you had control of the wheel when your life careened out of control? Uh, isn't there a better way? And I'm going to say, yes, there's a much better way, and that better way is let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. The voice translation puts this way. Let the Spirit bring order to your life. I like that. See, the Holy Spirit wants to guide your life, but he doesn't demand that you follow. I mean, he is a gentleman. You know, I remember one person uh, years ago, it's probably five or six years ago, that I went to visit in jail. And, uh, you know, he was, he was accused of something pretty horrific. And uh, so I went to visit him in jail, and he's declaring his innocence. And he said somebody had told him that God has a plan for my life. He says, is that true? And I'm like, yes, God has a plan for your life. The Bible says that uh, very clearly. And he says, what a great beep plan. And then he proceeded to repeat that a few times with just anger. And can I tell you something? God has a plan for your life. God has a tremendous plan for your life. But when it's like his was, he wasn't following God's plan. And when we, sometimes what I've experienced through the years is we reject God's plan, we go the absolute opposite direction, and we, we smash into a brick wall, and we come into, into uh, we come into the effects and consequences of our sin. Then we get mad at God because look, you don't have you have a horrible plan for my life. If you were real, this wouldn't be happening in my life. And guess what? It's because you weren't following His plan, right? This guy was in no way, shape, or form following God's plan. But then he got mad because his life hit the bricks. And then, by the way, later he admitted that he had done that which he was in jail for, and now he's been in prison for again these six years. The Holy Spirit wants to guide your life, but he doesn't make you follow. Here's the truth. God does have a great plan for your life. Are you following it? Are you letting him lead? And we can see this desire played out in several scriptures, right? Psalm 32, 8, 9, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. He's like, I've got the best pathway for your life. I'm going to guide you along that. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Have you ever been like the senseless horse 
or mule? I could read the King James Version this morning, but I won't. Have you ever been the senseless horse or mule? Yeah, right? But he says, I will guide you along. But sometimes there's a bit and bridle that has to be in effect because we're not listening. Romans 8, 12 through 15, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Your sinful nature is trying to get you to do something, right? It's trying to guide your life. And he says, for if you live by its dictates, if you live by its direction, by its guidance, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, all who follow his leading, all who let him guide us, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children, and now we call him Abba Father. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in the message says, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. You're not smart enough. I just added that part, but that's really what it's saying. That's what it's saying. Listen to God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. You're not going to keep yourself on track. Your spouse can't keep you on track. Your parents can't keep you on track. The Holy Spirit can keep us on track if we listen. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you, he will lead you, he will keep you on track. Now our text in Galatians 5 makes it clear that there is a daily battle. Right? There's a daily battle of who will lead your life. Uh, You may have been misled at some point that if you prayed a prayer of salvation and you gave your heart to Christ, like the battle's over. Can I tell you? The battle just began. All right, The bell just went ding, ding. And now daily you will face a battle. You will face the battle of Will I let my flesh win the day and rule the day, or will I let the Spirit of God guide my life today? Right? We get to be in, we get to decide that because every day these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So, how do you know who or what is leading your life? I think in this passage, and this is what I want you to remember from today's message, it gives us this hint on how to tell, and it's this the proof is in the fruit. All you got to do is look at the fruit of your life. And the fruit of your life will point to who's leading your life. The fruit of your life will point to who's leading your life. That's what Paul is telling us in this passage. If you want to know whether you're letting the Holy Spirit guide your life, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of your life. The fruit either points to our sinful nature or to the Spirit. And this passage, again, says there is a constant battle. And I'm sure you can probably think of some days that your flesh won, right? Your sinful nature won that day, right? Can you remember a day or two or a thousand like that? Those of you that are not raising your hands, you're letting letting your flesh win right this moment (laughs) as you lie in the house of God. All right. And hopefully you have some days that you can also remember that you're like, oh, the Spirit won that day. Like, I remember that day. I I really did do what he was leading me to do. And you can think of some days like that as well. But I want you to notice when we look at this passage is this. Whose fruit is it? Whose fruit is it? The verse again says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Right? It's not your fruit. It's the Holy Spirit's fruit. This kind of fruit, it's spiritual fruit. It's not born out of effort. You don't, you don't produce it, right? It's not like, I need more patience, so mm, boof, I'm going to pop out some fruit. You know, I need some patience, so I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to put sticky notes up in my, in my car that says, be patient, be patient, be patient. I'm going to put it up on my mirror. I'm going to put it up around my, everywhere I go, I'm going to see this reminder to be patient, to be patient. Can I tell you that? How well does that work? It might be okay. I'm not, you, if you need that, great. But that's not the way that patience is, is produced in your life. Patience is a fruit of his spirit at work in your life. And so it's, it's, it's not works. It's not effort. It's submission. It's not works. It's faith. It's not me. It's him. And so we have to allow his fruit to grow in our life. 
And I want to let you off the hook here. This is something that might be freeing to somebody here this morning. You are not responsible to grow the fruit. Like you can't. There is nothing you can do. Our job is to cultivate the soil, right? If you take, if you're planting a, an orchard, like there's nothing you can do to make apples grow on that tree. But what you can do is you can till the soil, you can prepare the soil, right? You can plant the tree, you can water it, you can make sure it's getting adequate sunlight, you can create the atmosphere out of which in that good, healthy atmosphere, a healthy tree will produce fruit, right? And so for you and I, our job is to cultivate the soil, you know, to, to dig up and to, to till the soil, to make sure that we're watering it, you know, so to speak, and we're getting enough sunlight and all that kind of stuff. We, we put it in the right atmosphere, and the Holy Spirit produces the fruit. That's the way it works. You're not responsible, though. You can't try extra hard and produce more love or more joy, Right? Peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You don't get that stuff just by trying harder. But what is the key as to how the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your life? Let. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Because if you let the Holy Spirit guide, direct, lead, steer, rule, shape, manage your life, then he will produce his fruit in your life. And the proof is in the fruit. Now, something that you may learn about the Holy Spirit, if you haven't already, is that his leading doesn't always make the logical sense. Like, you just think about some of the stories in God's Word. I mean, Moses, speak to that rock and when you do, fresh water will flow out of it. I mean, they were just dying of thirst. And so, and so Moses goes, and he doesn't speak to the rock. What does he do? He strikes the rock. And God, in his grace, poured out water anyway. But Moses was punished. He didn't get to go to the promised land because of that incident. Why did he strike the rock? Because the last time that they had that similar situation, God instructed him in that moment to strike the rock. And Moses listened and he obeyed. But this time when God says, speak to the rock, Moses goes, will I trust the way that God led me last time? Because that worked. Or will I do something different this time? And Moses said, I trust what he did last time. Boom. And he didn't obey in the moment. But God sometimes led in some weird ways. Think about the Joshua in the battle of Jericho. You know, I need you guys just to march around the city once. That doesn't sound like a real great military strategy. And so they did it. And then the next day they did it again and again. And don't you know by day four or five the soldiers are going, what are we doing here? Like we're not here for marching practice. The guys are starting to make fun of us up on the city walls like we don't know how to fight and we're just keep marching around one time a day. And then the last day they march around how many times? Seven times on the last day. And there's, don't you know, like the sixth lap that day, they're like, this is ridiculous. Let's just take the city. And then on the seventh lap, the walls fall down and they win the battle and they win the city. Now, if you and I saw our military strategists go in, you know, we're doing war in a country and we see them just marching around, just making laps around the city, I don't know about you, I'm a little concerned about our strategy. I don't think this is the best idea. But this is the truth. Like, God knew. He doesn't think that it's the right idea. He knew it was the right strategy. Uh, and so we have to be attuned. But we have to understand that sometimes he doesn't lead uh, the way that we'd like him to. In fact, if you think about it, like God specializes, if, if, if God's direction was a GPS, he doesn't specialize in the setting that says direct route. He doesn't specialize in the setting that says quickest route. He specializes in the setting that says scenic, <laughs> the scenic route. Uh, he, he, likes to take, he likes to take us on reroutes. You know, that he's learned, in fact, he knew already, but we've learned that it is in the place of the reroute that we have learned the greatest lessons. When we thought we were going the right way and God says, no, nah, we're going to go this direction. That, yes, over there is our ultimate goal, but we're going to go this way for a little bit and we're going to meander this way and we're going to get you over there eventually when you finally 
listen. And how many of you have learned that like those roads, the scenic route, it tests our obedience and it tests our patience. Because I don't, I don't know about you, but this is true of me. From the time I get in the car, I want to get there, wherever there is. Like I, I want to stop for as few bathroom breaks as possible. When I was a youth pastor, if we were driving and we'd only been driving an hour and someone asked to stop to go to the bathroom, my answer was no. You will hold it because I told you before we left not to drink too many drinks because we're not stopping for at least two hours, so you're going to hold it. And uh, yes, I sounded cruel, uh, but I wanted to get there, and I don't want to stop every hour. You know, we're not coordinating bathroom stops for everybody. We're going to stop. I'm going to stop in two hours, and then for my kids, it was we're going to stop in four hours, so, you know, we keep trying to put that off. But this is just the truth. I mean, it just it's going to take, it's going to test your patience. So here's the truth. you got to keep your eye on the fruit. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, Paul says the results are very clear. And really what he's saying is the fruit, the evidence, is very clear. You know, another way of saying that is um, something I saw on a billboard years ago. It was up on the side of a building. And I've seen hundreds of those through the years. But this one, for some reason, just struck a chord uh, in my heart, and it's become a, kind of one of those core values for me and something I remind myself all the time, and it's just true, and it's this. What you feed grows, and I've said that many times in other sermons. I will say it many more times. It's something I want to get in your spirit. What you feed grows. You want to know what kind of fruit that you're going to have in your life? I'll tell you this. It comes out of what you're feeding it. So your spirit, the Bible says right here, your spirit and God's spirit comes into conflict every day. Sinful nature and the spirit of God come into conflict every day. Guess which one's going to win? The one you're feeding, right? The one that you feed the most is going to be the one that wins that battle the majority of the time. So what you feed grows. And so Paul in this moment says, uh, when you follow, when you're following the directions of your, of your sinful nature, when you're following that voice, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality. Impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambi ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. And, and Paul includes this at the end, and I think it's brilliant. He concludes by saying, and other sins like these. Why did he include that verse? I think he included that line because he knew that your creativity and my creativity and genius were going to think of a lot of other ways to sin that wasn't included in this list. But what he's saying is these other sins, what our modern sins are, is they're like these. He's saying the etymology, the, 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 the origin story of our sin is connected with these sins, right? They come from this basis, other sins like these. Now, when you think about that kind of fruit, the fruit that's evident because of our sinful nature being in charge, when you think about that kind of fruit, does it go, you know what? That's like the kind of life I've been looking for. That's an awesome life. Like if I let that stuff, if that's what's in my life, like that, that's going to lead to more peace and patience and kindness and love. Like that's good fruit. Like none of us would say that. When we look at those things, we go, anytime I've experienced those kinds of things has been my life has been kind of out of control. Like, it's not been good. Like, I can enjoy, the Bible says that sin is pleasurable in a, for the moment, for a season, but, like, there's coming a day. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. That doesn't lead to your best life at all. So Paul goes on to add, after he lists, like, this is the fruit. This is how you know if your flesh is in control. He goes on to add, like, a list that says, when the Spirit's in charge. Right? When the Spirit's in charge. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, this fruit is impossible to produce on your own. But if we let the Holy Spirit guide our lives, he produces it. Now, this tells us how to tell if the Holy Spirit is directing our lives guiding our lives, but here's the million-dollar question. How do we let the Holy Spirit 
guide our life. Let me give you a couple of quick principles. The first one is that we have to be a follower of Christ, right? We have to be a follower of Christ. You can't have the fruit if you don't have the seed. Like the fruit can't grow in your life if there's not a seed there first. And the seed is the gospel, that we've responded to the gospel. We've turned our life over to Jesus. That's the first part, right? That we can't, we can't have fruit without the seed. Uh, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So we have to have that relationship. The second thing is we have to understand how the Spirit speaks. Like it's not usually an audible voice. You know, and I've talked to people that have heard an audible voice before, but that's just not common. Uh, you know, I've heard a very clear voice, but it wasn't audible. The way I say it, it, it was actually much louder than that. Uh, I heard it inside. It wasn't with my ears, but with my spirit. And so the spirit doesn't usually speak in an audible voice. It doesn't mean he can't, but he doesn't normally speak that way. But an example of how the Holy Spirit guided the disciples is found in Acts 17. And Luke says this, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now, isn't that like a really open, kind of broad way to put it? But he was saying, like we were considering this direction and we talked about it and we prayed about it. In the end, we, we were like, we just sensed peace in that direction. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And we had unity around that idea. And we said, yeah, that's, that's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit leads and directs and guides. <coughs> And sometimes you might be strongly impressed to do something. And maybe it's something really simple, like you feel led to go across the street and take some cookies or meet your neighbors or stop and help somebody on the side of the road. And it could be a really just simple and clear, small step that he's just leading. And you just feel that, that compulsion to do something that you've just not done before. And maybe it's like everything looks like you ought to go this direction. Like you get a job offer and it's like double the money. I mean, it's so much more money. And, you know, it's going to open up opportunities for all these other things. And like everything from the flesh just goes, chase that, do that, go after that. But there's a check in your spirit that goes, no, that's not, that's not the path I have for you. I want you to say no to that. And that's, that check is from the Holy Spirit. One of the things that, that I've learned is sometimes we're not even aware that God's Spirit is leading us. One of the verses that is one of, I just, it's kind of my, one of my life verses, is that the Lord directs the footsteps of the righteous. And what he means by that is my job in that is to walk rightly. Right, my job is to the best of my ability is to follow leading of the Spirit and just to walk rightly, to walk a godly life. And when I do, his word says he directs my steps. What it doesn't say is it doesn't say like I'm going to know that the whole time. It just says the Lord directs the footsteps of the righteous. So one thing that uh, Joyce Meyer said in a recent sermon that I thought was powerful is she says we live life forward, but we understand it backwards. And that is so true. We're just walking life forward and we're making decisions and we're doing things. And then all of a sudden we look backwards and go, oh, like that's how God was leading me, right? So those are some of the ways that God leads us. But how can we recognize that inner, that inner prompting from the Spirit of God? One, I think this is critical, is understand that the the Holy Spirit will never lead in any way that violates his word, in any way that violates the Bible. He will never lead you to do something that violates his word. You know, I've heard people before, I've, I've heard people, literally this has come out, of, you know, God's leading me to leave my husband. God's leading me. God's leading me, right, that it's okay that we have sex outside of marriage. You know, I have peace about it. You know, that God said it's okay. Can I tell you, that is not the voice of the Holy Spirit because he will never, ever lead us into something that violates his word, right? And so that's a really critical, important. Any inner impression that conflicts with the Bible 
has to be rejected. We go, that's not the Spirit's voice. He does not violate that. Receiving God's guidance depends on our willingness to submit to his voice. Otherwise, our own desire can mislead us. You know, something that you want to be true, we can make that sound like the Spirit of God, right? Because we're not really willing to submit to what he's wanting to do in our life. And so we're like, oh, that, yeah, that sounds good. Like, that's okay. So we have to be willing to submit. Um, a daily prayer life will cause us to grow in our relationship with God and it helps us become increasingly sensitive to his leading. You know, the more that you get to know God, you know, you have that daily time, the more that you get to know him, the more you're gonna be able to recognize his voice. And his word promises, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. How do we learn the Spirit's voice? We spend time with them. How do you learn anybody else? If you're in a relationship with that person, you could be in the same room for 20 years and you don't really know them. How do you know them? You spend time. You talk to them. And that's what praying is. Praying is us talking to God and reading God's word is God talking to us. And so we spend time, we get to know each other. So as we begin to let the Holy Spirit lead and direct and guide our lives, can I tell you this? Others are gonna begin to notice. There will be changes that begin to take place in your life. The Holy Spirit, uh, if you let the Holy Spirit guide your life, you might find that your language begins to change. Now, when I was in the fifth and sixth grade, I took great pride in having the widest vocabulary of naughty words, right? I had a wide vocabulary. I took great pride in that. And I, I came to Christ when I was a freshman in high school. And you know what nobody had to do? Nobody had to say, you know, you really shouldn't talk that way anymore. Like, you really should start to clean that up. Nobody had to tell me that. You know what happened, though, is my language changed. Because now I had somebody else that I, would, I had invited in, and I learned that that wasn't a good representation of him if I was trying to communicate with friends and, and others. And so he just cleaned up my language. And maybe it's that your attitude begins to change. Like you were all depressed and sad and somber before and all of a sudden you have joy and they're like, what's up with you? Where'd you find that drug? I want that one. You know, but you just begin to change or maybe it's your emotional well-being begins to change or maybe it's your, your behavior just begins to change and you don't have to go, hey guys, look at me. Do you see all these changes that are taking? You don't, we don't really have to do that. It's the Holy Spirit that's producing that. We take no pride in that. But why do those, change, those things change? Because when the Holy Spirit is guiding and we're following, then we're changing. If the Holy, the Holy Spirit's always guiding, we said that earlier, right? And to the extent that we are listening and following, we're changing. He's changing us, he's transforming us because that is what he does. He changes us. We'll be getting rid of certain things. We'll be producing the evidence because the proof of who's leading is in the fruit. So our job then is to pursue, to pursue the Holy Spirit, to chase after the Holy Spirit, to let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. And when we do, there will be fruit because what we feed grows. Every head bowed and every eye closed in this place this morning. And I, I just want to simply open the altars during this last song to simply pursue, to pursue the Holy Spirit, to passionately chase after God, to declare your desire. God, help me. Lord, give me strength. I want to let you, I want to let you guide my life. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I want you. If you want the Holy Spirit to guide your life, then take a step. Tell him invite him but remember we can't have the fruit if we don't have the seed so if you're not a follower of Christ invite him ask him to come into your life forgive you of your sins to be your Lord and Savior come to one of our prayer team members that will be coming up and tell him what your need is today but let's all stand this morning and as we sing this song that says come to the altar I just implore you to follow listen let the Holy Spirit guide.